Hello, what are you reading? Hi, it's the Holy Quran. But isn't the Quran only for Muslims? Not at all. Its teachings are addressed to all humanity, from heads of state to everyday people like us. What does it teach us? It's a book of life for life. No thinking person should pass through life without it. Where can I get a copy? From the IPCI, 124 Queen Street, Durban. I don't read my Bible because I don't think there's a lot of help in it really. But and I don't go to church unless I feel sad, which is the place I do. God's with us everywhere. When I look at the sky, look at that sky going on to infinity. Something far beyond me or any human being. Yes. A lot of gas, I think, up there at the moment. <laughs> Apart from the gas, I think there are... It says in the Bible that he knows all the stars by name. That speaks to me of God's great power and his great glory. And when I look at the small, intricate things of nature, it speaks to me of how God has taken care of even the smallest manifestations of creation. Good evening. Well, are we small manifestations of God's creation, as the man on the film said, or purely products of chance, who for their own comfort have invented the idea of God? To put it another way, did God create man or man create God? It's a choice everybody's got to make. This book, The Probability of God, that's just been published, makes the incredibly important assertion that modern science is beginning to reveal the existence of a creator God. Its author, Hugh Montefiore, the Bishop of Birmingham, is with us here tonight. And next to him, we have Paul Davis, who's the Professor of Theoretical Physics at the University of Newcastle. And then on my left, I'm joined by Professor Sir Freddie Eyre, philosopher and logician, and well known to all of us. And on my far left, Professor Sir Herman Bondy, Master of Churchill College, Cambridge, and renowned scientist and President of the British Humanist Association. We have with us as well a very distinguished audience, 
and we shall doubtless be hearing from them later on in the program. But is a discussion on the nature and existence of God relevant today? We've already heard some of your comments, which we recorded when we took a stroll outside St. Paul's Cathedral. To our surprise, we found most people rather interested in the idea of God. What's your God like? Someone I can talk to when I'm feeling on my own, I suppose. The way he's normally portrayed is as an individual, something in man's own image, and I don't believe that at all. I think he's got a lot of value for a lot of people, especially for lonely people and old people, probably. And for you too? He's my sort of reserve when I'm on my own. He's big, he's got a beard and long hair. Black, long hair, yeah, black beard. I don't think he is a, like a person, but he's just, just a voice. I think it's great and it just helps you and then in the night sometimes in the dark you feel so scared but then when you think of God you don't feel scared anymore. He's tall with a bed and he's just a great man. So he looks a bit like you in some ways. Hmm. I do believe there is something that um, that's uh, well not exactly makes decisions for us but um, knows more than, than we do. Do you believe in the God? Um, no, only actually from, a, from the point of view that I do believe that there is a point beyond which people are unable to comprehend. And when that point is arrived at, then they encapsulate the whole thing in the concept of a God. When I look around at the suffering in this world, then I don't believe there's a God. If there was a God, it wouldn't cause the suffering that there is in this world. Then again, I think of Ethiopia with a live aid concert, and maybe there is. To get all people together, to get money together for children. I think, yeah, there is. It's got to be. Well, was our universe created by a God or not? Hugh Montefiore's book says yes, and takes a fresh look at natural theology, which, as far as I understand it, is the argument that says that you can perceive the existence of God directly from the evidence of nature. And that, of course, includes scientific evidence. Hugh Montefiore, couldn't it be argued that you are, in fact, trespassing on other people's patch? Well, yes, you could argue anything, but uh, I don't really <laughs> see why uh, we shouldn't reflect on what the scientists have said. I think people mix up uh, science with the philosophy of science, that is, its meaning and interpretation. I really think anyone can have a go at that. I certainly have, and will continue to do so. Uh, I don't want to prove from the natural sciences that God exists. Uh, that, that, I don't think, can be done. But I do think we can now see that there's a high probability that, that, that uh, this world is not a random occurrence. And that seems to me to say a very great deal. Right. Herman Bondi, what do you actually feel about that? Because do you feel in any sense it's a misuse of science? No, I wouldn't call it a misuse. And I was very much impressed by the book for its erudition and for its honesty. But I do think that the argument of this very good book leaves me stone cold. Not because I'm short of awe, not because I'm short of wonder. I feel our universe is wonderful and something to be awestruck by. What worries me is that this book will be taken by many people to prove Christianity, or at least to make it probable, or to prove or to make probable some other religion in which there is a revelation which makes people say, I know God's will. And that, to me, is a great source of evil. No, well, I must come back here and say that all that you can do from natural <coughs> theology is show the, the hunger in men and women's hearts for God's personal self-disclosure, which I believe that he has given us, and although terrible things have been done in the name of religion, I will agree with you, I also think that the most wonderful things have been done, and I'm always interested in people like you only mention the terrible things. Not only. Right. Earlier on, Paul Davis, I described you as Hugh Montefiore's scientific champion, and presumably you've got a considerable amount of sympathy with Hugh. Would you like to explain that a bit further? Uh, yes, perhaps I could summarise my own position uh, before I begin Absolutely. as being uh, perhaps best described as an awestruck agnostic, which is to say that uh, through my scientific investigations uh, I have become more and more impressed uh, with the uh, incredibly 
stupendously intricate uh, nature of the cosmos as we come to understand the universe in greater and greater detail. Uh, so it seems more and more remarkable that things have been arranged such that, uh, in its broadest sense, the universe is self-aware. That is, that it permits the existence of uh, intelligent observers, uh, such as ourselves. And it seems to me that this is uh, not something which is inevitable, that the world could have been arranged differently, uh, and that the fact that things have been arranged uh, so that uh, we can exist and observe the world, uh, and that, moreover, our existence seems to depend very delicately upon the organization of the cosmos and the nature of the laws of physics, the fact that that is so uh, seems to me a puzzle, and a puzzle that deserves an explanation. In other words, uh, I would like to know why the world is the way it is. I can't accept it as a brute fact. I would like some sort of explanation. Right, Freddie Eyre. Um, I imagine that as far as you're concerned, we've been talking a whole lot of rubbish so far. <laughs> I'd like to hear your view on the subject. I don't think we've been talking rubbish. I think there's been a lot of bad logic. But that's not quite the same thing. What the last argument comes to is saying the world is arranged as it is, therefore somebody arranged it. Now, this is a very poor argument because it could apply to however the world is arranged. I mean, all that you, you have said and all that I'm afraid the bishop has said in a book which I also admired very much, I thought it was a very honest book and a, and a very erudite book, I mean, needed to say so. Nevertheless, all he was saying was there are these causes, there are these effects, and had the causes been different, the effects would have been different. Nobody's going to dispute this. What is totally lacking is any justification for the assumption that the world as it is was designed, and had the world been different, it would not have been designed. And in fact, saying it's all designed by God is not an explanation of anything at all. You're just saying, here I give up, but because, and in fact, President David has admitted this, so science goes no further, therefore we're going to bring old, old noble daddy to uh, make us all feel cheerful. That won't do. The reason why I'm interested in the natural sciences here is that so often you hear people saying the natural sciences have disproved God or there's no reasonable basis for believing in God. I'm afraid Freddie Ayer's backing a loser here. I mean, the, it, it could just be a brute fact that, that human beings have evolved uh, with their amazing capacities for relationship and for uh, their experience of God is phony. It could just be true. It could be true that our intimations of morality have no ultimate sanction, it, uh, that our, our, our experience of what is true and good and beautiful has no, is, isn't a window into reality. But the simplest explanation of the lot, the simplest explanation in logic, is that there is a creator. Right. There are many other ways of looking for God um, other than science. And some might actually say better ways. And most of the world's religions believe that God takes steps to reveal himself and reveal the world to us. And I'd like very much to hear from Mahur Krishnamurti, who is a Hindu who is actually sitting in the audience here tonight. The Hinduism says very clearly, as far as the creation is concerned, it's not just God created the world and just left to itself. God himself became the beings, and the Hinduism strongly believes in God who creates, protects, and ultimately he dissolves. This is the belief of God, and the Hindus worship him with form and without form. The nature is the other face of God, and the Hindu strongly tries to describe the indescribable by worshipping him by various images. Uh, can I go to Ahmed Didat to talk about the role of revelation? You see, the, uh, the Muslim believes that God Almighty, he reveals his messages in word form. And in that word form, this book, the Holy Quran, was revealed through the Holy Prophet Muhammad during the 23 years of his prophetic life. And it deals with these problems more directly instead of guessing, and God Almighty, he reasons with his creation by asking him questions. He said, now, how can you not believe in God? How can you not believe in him, seeing that you were non-existent and he brought you into being, and he will cause you to die, and he will bring you back to life again, and to him will be your return? So how can you not, in other words, the way you have been computerized, is the way the Creator made you, you would naturally deflect towards God as a magnetic needle does towards not. Can I just ask you whether your God is the same God as Hugh Montefiore's, the bishops? 
it is the same God except that in our concepts we differ. You see, uh, the Archbishop ultimately will come to making Jesus Christ as God, a God incarnate. Now, the Muslim says, no, God is God and man is man. Right, can I move on now? Philip Eden, as a Buddhist, what in fact do you feel about this? Because your concept of God is quite different. Yes, well, as far as Buddhism is concerned, there is rather a different approach. We uh, feel that there is a fundamental reality or truth or ground of being, which of course is, is in everything and behind everything. I think that many of the followers of theistic uh, religions tend to believe that God is out there somewhere in the cosmos and that it's necessary for human beings to try and somehow establish a relationship with him. As far as the Buddhist is concerned, that reality is everywhere and in everything. So that the task of the individual is to understand that reality in himself. And that is the, uh, the methods that are developed in Buddhism to help somebody to come to that realization. We feel that the, the problem mm. with a creator is that inevitably one must then ask the question, who created the creator? And that, of course, is endless. You can go on and on doing that. So somewhere you have to start with the first cause. And surely the first cause is the universe itself. Man is one way in which the universe experiences itself. But your God is obviously very different then from Hugh Montefiore's God. Um, There's a point that Herman Bondi raised about, you know, the, yeah. um, the fact that many terrible things have been done in the, in, the, in the name of religion. And I think it's perhaps important to um, point out that probably the reason for this is that people for a long time, I think particularly in the West, have had this concept, you know, I'm here, and the truth is over there somewhere, and there is a narrow path that leads to that truth. If you have that concept, which I sort of think of as a fan-like concept, then inevitably, if you believe that you have found the right path, all the other paths are wrong, and your task is to force everyone onto that narrow path. Surely it would be so much better if we had this concept of the truth being, as it were, at the center of a circle. We are somewhere on that circumference. And there are many different paths that lead into that truth. And the thing for us to realize, I think, is that the particular path that we choose is very much a, a, a personal thing. And it depends on many different factors. It probably depends on, the, on the, the person that we have met that may have explained that path to us and various experiences we've had. If only we realize, all right, this path for me is the right one at this particular time, but that does not invalidate the other paths. But are you saying, therefore, that there's only one truth, that we only have one truth that we can actually listen to and experience? There can only be one truth with a capital T, one reality. And I think mm. the point is that all the great religions have been trying inadequately in their own way to point man towards that truth. But for heaven's sake, don't let's you know, have this idea that there is only this one wretched narrow path and that all the others are wrong. All right, can I move the discussion on and say that with, we've dealt to some extent with revelation, but other people who are believers and Hugh Montefiore has, if you like, supporters who don't only argue from design, would say that it's much more about experience and not about either design or revelation at all. I hope he wouldn't. And the experience, no, not Hugh Montefiore, other people would. And the, exper the, the experience is God showing himself to us or us feeling him. And Eric Dowell, you're an evangelist in the Church of England. Would you argue with that? I think I would a bit, yes, yes. because uh, <clears throat> I do believe that you cannot prove God scientifically. Science can only deal with the material of this current universe. God is, is necessarily not of this universe. He's superior and outside of it. So consequently, you can't prove him scientifically or disprove him. But of course you want to go much further than that. If there's a God who made me, I want to know who he is. I want to know what he's like. And of course, we Christians believe that he's actually done that, said it for us in the person of Christ. Can and I we also it? believe that he's alive today and we can know him. So that, that's what we're here to say. And that anybody can, act, can actually say, go beyond just the evidence, whether it's for or against, and say, God, if you're really there, I want to know you because I'm prepared to know the truth, whatever it costs me. Right. Hugh Montefiore. I do actually think that religious experience is a very important pointer. And in my book, I say it's the convergence of, as I see it, science showing us we're not just random product, probably not just random products, and conscience, and experience. 
I mean, why is it that between 30 and 60 percent of, of people, even in this secular country, lay claim to some form of religious experience? Pretty early. And one point I'm continually making is that the postulation of God explains nothing whatsoever, because it is consistent with anything that happens. And of course it's consistent with people having religious experience, I mean, or not having it, or consistent with people you say consciousness is implanted, I mean, uh, e equally well you can say that sadism is implanted. I mean, whatever is, 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 but you've got to explain in some way that it's, it would have been otherwise if there had not been a creator. And this is what is totally missing, any kind of rational argument. Right. I actually <laughs> wanted to bring up just something of the evidence that, that is within human experience of just the si sheer business of significance. When I say to my wife, I love you, I mean something. I do not mean I, an accidental conglomeration of molecules from some anti-diluvian swamp, happen to feel a totally accidental attraction towards you, another totally accidental conglomeration, etc. I mean, I love you. And when, if you say to me, but you're just an accident happening to another accident, something inside me says, that's not right. Now, that's not good scientific evidence, but it's human evidence. And I don't honestly think you can ignore it. It's part of humanity. And it, in the end, what it means is, I mean something because there is a meaning and there's a meaner. I must protest against the previous speaker's grotesque misuse of the word accident. I have a wife too and I love her very much. When I say that I love her, I don't, accident, I don't mean, believe that she came, came into the world uncaused any more than that I did. Oh, my love doesn't have a cause, psychological cause. This is, this levity in using these words shocks me. But, Freddie, well, you, you do think it. that both you and your wife are the product of an ultimately meaningless process, don't you? If you mean that I don't think that our existence was planned by some supernatural being, yes. No, but it's meaningless. meaningless. No, I, I do not accept the word meaningless. I do not think that my love for her is meaningless. I think my love for her has a very great deal of meaning. It's very intense. Has meaning for you, and but for no her, ultimate meaning. I don't know what ultimate meaning means here. Yeah. So I'm going to move on because, in fact, we gone slightly off part of our subject and we haven't looked at other ways of experiencing God. Many people say that there is a different way, a much quieter way of experiencing God. Can we ask Sister Martina Hayden? I mean, I've listened with great interest to the arguments and I couldn't help looking back over my own life. I mean, I found myself a Catholic, born in a Catholic Ireland. I thought there was nothing else in the world. And my journey has been about finding out all the different aspects of the truth. And I went through all the phases of trying to prove the existence of God from arguments and learning about the first cause, uncaused, and it left me as cold as ice. It just, it just didn't do anything for me as a person. And I think in, in these last years, it has been much more about looking for God within the design of my life, actually seeing design in my life, how somehow I am being led. I mean, even the fact that I join a co an order uh, which is dedicated to searching for truth uh, is not to me an accident. And I hear all the different truths and I'm really excited about what's happening in science. Uh, because I can see that that really is, uh, it, it, there's, there's a convergence of truth. And there's so much more humility. I'm not saying I'm humble. As they say, if you say you are, you aren't. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but I'm saying that the man is, scientists, theologians, people in general are much more humble than they were, say, 20 years ago. I mean, I, I was locked in combat with, Fr with Freddie Eyre 20 years ago or so about conscience. I wouldn't argue that way now. I don't want to. I, 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 well, I can't match his mind. And I don't think the mind can actually say it all. I, I find myself going to my heart about religion. And I, I just discover more evil in myself and more good as I go along. And the revelation of Christ in Christianity helps me there immensely because I find that Christ didn't talk theological argument or logical argument. He didn't use any of those. He talked about the lilies of the field. He said the kingdom of heaven is like, that's a simile. So for me, 
God is revealing himself in me, in everybody. You know, I, I felt really close to the Buddhist gentleman who was speaking over there. I really felt I can relate to that too. I can, I can look into the heart of a rose and it speaks to me. I can also look into the Bible and it speaks to me. Professor Eyre, are you going to say that that's not a valid experience and that that's not a valid argument? I think it's not an argument at all. It is a very moving and personal, personal position, which I think is the last to want to criticize. Mm. Right. Well, this debate hasn't included one essential element, and that's looking at the alternative choice that belief in God is totally man-made. And Rising, how do you view that? Well, as an atheist, of course, I can't believe that God created man. I think my well, parents have not. something to do with it. <laughs> uh, I, I have a distinct feeling that we're taking too provincial a view of the terms God and religion. We think of it in terms of dear old pink Church of England. Uh, but of course, that is only one uh, very small aspect of religion. Uh, both Torquemada and St. Francis of Assisi uh, were religious and had a, an image of God, but they were very different images of God, one from the other. The Ayatollah Khomeini and uh, Bishop Montefiore, I'm sure, have quite different gods uh, in mind uh, when they think about religion. Even the Jehovah of the Old Testament is very different to the kind of God that the bishop uh, is talking about. So I think it's very important to realize that if man creates God in his image, as I'm sure he does, mm. he has many different needs and consequently creates many different types of God. Can you, can you define that a bit more closely? What are, you actually, what are you actually saying? I mean, I can see Hugh Montefiore blenching, but can you actually ex simplify that a little for our audience? Well, if your personality is warlike, uh, wants to proselytize, is aggressive and so on, then you go for the kind of God that the Koran portrays, which wants to proselytize the world uh, and is warlike uh, and so on. If you are peace-loving, you want to have an assurance of a future life and so on and happiness, then perhaps you adopt the kind of God portrayed by, by the Ahmed Church Ahmed would you agree with that? I don't, ma'am. You see, uh, I don't think that our brother has read the Quran. The way it seems. You see, there are 99 attributes of God, and out of that, this one that you are talking about is non-existent in this book. Can I ask you a question? Are you saying then that the Muslim God is actually a peace-loving God who wants peace in the world? Yes, yes. And he tells us that if, if somebody wars against you, you have a right to fight back, unlike turning the other cheek. What about it's the concept of the holy war, the jihad? Yes, that is a struggle for righteousness. For example, Britain, when she was under attack by Hitler, what you did was jihad. And we take our hat to you, to Winston Churchill, for, you know, putting the spirit into your people. Now that is what is this, a defensive war. And you had to retaliate. Because if you didn't, if you just sat back, you know, keeping Hitler at, at bay, it wouldn't have served the purpose, you have to attack. And in the state of nature, everyone has a right to do that. So Islam allows us to defend ourselves and to extend our hostilities to a reasonable amount of uh, satisfaction and retaliation. All right, can I come back to Hans Eisenk? And perhaps you'd like to develop it a little further, because uh, we've actually heard an exchange between the two of you. But would you like to come out on a little bit further about perhaps other religions and not only about Islam? Well, it's not so much a particular religion, because within each religion you have all sorts of different gods, as I was trying to say, that of Torquemada and that of Francis of Assisi are all Christian gods, they're entirely different. Uh, so man creates God in his own image, even within a given religion, and certainly between different religions. The God he needs will be a different God according to his own personal requirements and to the kind of society in which he lives. Mm -hmm. Our society is different to that of the time of the Crusades, and consequently we need a different kind of God. Can I ask you then about the role of conscience, and where does conscience come from? Well, psychological experiments on conscience have shown pretty conclusively that you mm -hmm. can manipulate it and create it through a process of social learning, Pavlovian conditioning, and so on. It is something that is acquired through social influences, uh, although there is also a strong <coughs> genetic factor in it. Uh, in other words, altruism, the tendency to do good to others, 
uh, is certainly, to some extent at least, genetically controlled in the sense that if you look at identical and fraternal twins, there's a much higher correlation within the uh, identical than within the fraternal groups. And the same is true of religion. I think that's a very important point, Professor that religious Eyre. beliefs are in fact genetically controlled. Professor Eyre, where do you think conscience comes from? I entirely agree with the last speaker. I have no quarrel with that at all. Anybody in the general audience? Yes, in the front row. I'd, I'd like to throw out uh, a, a definition that might be helpful to some people of, of the difference between religion and Christianity because there's a distinct uh, difference. Religion uh, is largely man, by his own efforts, some of which have been demonstrated tonight in terms of mental gymnastics, trying to get to God and looking at the most powerful thing like the sun and bowing to that. Christianity is God coming for man. And I was interested in Herman Bondi's remark that he's an anti-revelationist. If there's a God at all, there's no way we can know anything about him by guesswork, only that he should reveal himself to us, which he did in the person of Jesus Christ and became okay, human but evidence. But where does conscience come from? Conscience is given to us by God, and we are in the process of numbing it and pushing it down to suit our own purposes and interests, which is called selfishness. Other people in the audience, where does, general, where, where does the conscience, where does the idea of conscience come from? Yes. I would say the conscience comes from the human soul. It's the human soul speaking, speaking out and crying out for release. Um, okay, it's not just fear. Do you not think that it's an animal fear, a fear of being found out? Yes, Daniel Rubenstein. I just think it's a sort of fear of alienation, really, being cut off from the rest of the community. And I think perhaps that, for instance, that Live Aid event demonstrated, demonstrated a huge sense of community. Everybody um, wanting to join yes, in. Herman Bondi, would you share that? Well, I certainly feel that we are basically herd animals, and that all herd animals must have feelings like conscience. Hugh yeah. Montfort, what do you feel? Well, I don't think conscience is to be equated with either wish fulfillment or going with the herd, because my conscience often forces me to stand out from the herd. I think it is the God-given means by which I have to act responsibly. And I think that is uh, I, how it's evolved uh, is something for the, I don't, I don't understand it in animals. Uh, I look to the scientist, I look to the psychiatrist to see how it functions with the ego, the superego. But I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about what it actually is. I think it's the God-given faculty by which we can behave responsibly. And it's not to be equated with things like utility or welfare or wish fulfillment or anything like that. I must protest against this assumption certain faculties are God-given as opposed to others. I disagreed, for example, with you, Nishan, when he talked about love, indeed. I mean, love is a human emotion, but there's no particular reason to single that out as pointing to the existence of a supernatural being any more than the other human emotion. I mean, all human emotions are to be accounted for in the same sort of terms, in the kind of terms that I think, or one of his colleagues, would account for them. And just to single out love is, is quite arbitrary. I mean, I mean, the assumption is that we are naturally egotistic, predatory, and so on, and that only because of some supernatural agency do we behave decently to one another. This is absolutely <coughs> contrary to the facts. We have, in fact, as even David Hume pointed out, a uh, uh, principle of sympathy, innate principle of sympathy, as well as an innate prin principle of egoism. And one no more needs a divine explanation than another. William Harkin. Look, let's get this straight. There is no reason on earth why we shouldn't go around acting like perfect pigs to why all and sundry. There is no big Monty Python foot <coughs> poised to come and squash us if we act <laughs> badly. Yet, a lot of us do act well towards our fellow man. But why should we not? That was just the point that I was making. Because there I was just protesting against your assumption that it's somehow natural for us to, to, to uh, to be want to be decent to one another and unnatural to be decent to one another. What possible ground have you for that assumption? In this world today, my experience is that it strikes me that more people are being unreasonable to each other than are being reasonable. Well, in that case, you should believe in, you should be Manichaean and believe in the devil. But come uh, on, but but if you're taking, if you're, if you're taking your deity as accounting for human attitudes, that's the way you should go. Well, it's totally illogical. Well, it's Professor Eyre, all other species are selfish, basically, aren't they? No. No. By no means. By no <laughs> means. Go, go ahead. Herman Bondi. But I wasn't saying that our being herd animals means that everybody has to move with the herd. What I do mean to say that we are not solitary beings. We've got 
to have the faculty as other animals live together to get on in some fashion with each other. Tina Mecha. You just mentioned the devil with great uh, aplomb, but the be devil's best trick is to make man believe he does not exist. And I think that's what the problem is, that you know, we are in a state of chaos suddenly instead of harmony. And it is the state of harmony that we are trying to create in this world and not distort the minds of children by showing them violence and explaining that that violence is necessary to bring about harmony. Mahmoud Krishnamurti. Agree. Hinduism clearly says what is God. Answer to our dear friend's question. God is truth. God is love. And God is good. Whatever name you call, it is God. Why allergy to the name God? Love, beauty is God. So you don't actually feel that he's supernatural? That God is supernatural? Hugh Montefiore, what do you feel about that? Well, I do think that God uh, discloses himself uh, in the smallest particle of matter and in our human relationships and in love is to me a window into God but I do think that he has supernaturally disclosed himself to us that's why I'm a Christian because I believe that he has uh, been incarnate as you said that's what Christians believed I believe God was incarnate and suffered the worst that people could do to him. Now, this is, to me, the only way I can see my way through the problem of evil. Can I just remind people, and perhaps human to fur in particular, of Einstein's concept of God, which was, yes, God who made the universe in wonderful ways, but had not the slightest interest in us human beings and was a totally impersonal thing that couldn't possibly care for our prayers. I want to talk to a psychologist next, Leslie Francis. I would like to go back to the question you keep asking. Did God create man or did man create God? And I see that as a deceptively simple kind of language used. They're two completely different order questions. It is for the theologian in me to come to the question, did God create man? But the psychologist in me would want to answer your question in a different way. Did man create the image of God? He cannot be go beyond looking at image. And I suspect what we've heard in the discussion tonight is a whole lot about the variability in the image that is used, but we haven't been able to get on to the ontology beyond that image. I'm sorry, everybody, but we've run out of time. The choice that is open to us is whether God made man or man made God. It's now over to you. All that remains for me to do is to thank the audience for their contributions and, of course, the panel. I'm sorry we didn't have time to say any more, and from me, good night. sisters to loosen their limbs if they stand up and take a deep breath before sitting down again. All of you, please. Please. Thank you. <laughs> take a deep breath or two and loosen your limbs and uh, you can relax. <coughs> uh, the previous two lectures, <laughs> Chairman, ladies and gentlemen, the previous two speakers, you know, have been dealing with this theme of the East and the West getting together, meeting the East meets the West. It's a kind of a symposium we have been having. And in that symposium, the subject of law seems to be very technical and very dry. And to build bridges, between the East and the West. I said, now, most probably in the minds of the organizers, they have taken me as a man from the East. And they are right in that I have really come from the East. I am a man who was born in India some 60 years ago. So I am really a man of the East. But now, since the theme that has been selected for me is religious, about Islam. Now, I take exception to Islam being described as a religion of the East. If we take Islam to be an Eastern religion, then Judaism and Christianity are equally Eastern. 
because Islam, Judaism and Christianity, the, all these three originate in the same geographical area in the Middle East. Though I personally come from India and my forefathers were Muslims, born Muslims, originally in the very dim past Hindus. But now to share this East and West, for the moment if I agree that Islam is from the East and the Western religions would be then Judaism and Christianity for the purpose of this discussion this evening. I will accept that. So what is the relationship between these three? Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Uh, in reality from the Muslim point of view these three are not three religions. From the Muslim point of view it's the one and the same religion on different levels. And in the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, there is not an iota of difference. Sounds surprising, doesn't it? In the fundamentals of the teachings of Moses, Jesus and Muhammad, there is not an iota of difference between these three. And I prove it to you. I said, you see, the very first commandment, as it was given by God Almighty to the Holy Prophet Moses, in Hebrew, this is what it sounds like. So, Shama Israel Adonai Rahainu Adonai Echad, which means, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Some 1,300 years after Moses, a learned man of the Jews, described as a scribe, he poses the question to Jesus in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter 12, verse 29. He said, Master, in the Hebrew language, Rabbi, what commandment is the first of all? And Jesus answers and says unto him in the Hebrew language, Shama Israelu Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echa. Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. He repeated word for word what was given by Moses some 1300 years before. Not an iota of difference in the fundamental as given by Moses and Jesus. Coming to Muhammad, some 600 years later, after Jesus Christ, a Christian deputation <coughs> approaches Muhammad in Medina and they have a discussion, a dialogue for three days and three nights. During the course of this dialogue, the spokesman for the Christian poses the question. He said, oh Muhammad, all I tell us now, what is your concept of God? And Muhammad, as the Muslims believe, was made to say, on the authority of God, in the Arabic language, he said, Qul huwa Allahu ahad. Say, he is God, the one and only. Muhammad said, ahad. Jesus said, ahad. Moses said, ahad. I'm asking, what is the difference? Actually, it is the same word meaning the same thing. The difference between ahad and ahad in Arabic, if I, if it was a blackboard here, I would have written it for you. If I wrote ahad, and to make the, it into ikhat, I just have to put a dot on the ha. It becomes ha. That's all. It's only the difference of a dot in the calligraphy, in writing. But in the meaning, the sense, 100% the same. So we Muslims, we say that in the fundamentals of the teachings of the prophets, no difference. Then these differences that are there, we say these were out of necessity. See, Islam we say, is the culmination of the teachings of Moses and Jesus, brought to perfection. The Holy Prophet Moses, we Muslims we accept him as our own prophet, as we accept all the Jewish prophets as our prophets. That Moses was catering for the needs of his people. They had just been rescued from the Egyptian bondage. They were traveling in the Sinai Peninsula, oasis to oasis. A nation under those circumstances needed a law that would give them quick justice. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. There was no time for lengthy litigations. There was no time for putting a man in prison. That anti-social character, the adulterer, kill him, stone him to death, get rid of him. It was more merciful to kill him, stone him, than to leave him in the desert to die of hunger and thirst. And he becomes an object lesson for others. He said, you see, this guy here, according to our system, he could have had a hundred wives. Because there was no law. There was no law among the Jews as to the limit of the wives. Solomon, if you read the Holy Bible, 
we are told, had a thousand wives and concubines. Seven hundred wives and three hundred concubines, altogether one thousand. There was no law against the number of wives that one could have. So under those circumstances, if one was not enough, you could have taken another. If two were not enough, you could have taken four. Why did you go and interfere with somebody else's property, eh, despoiling somebody else's rights? This, is, this guy, he deserves death, stoning him to death. And to me, this is the law, eye for an eye, tooth for the tooth, eye for an eye, quick justice. Get moving, there's work to be done. This was the philosophy, the psychology behind the laws that were given. And these laws, we Muslims believe, were given by God Almighty for the needs of the children of Israel. But laws have a tendency to change the characters of people over a period of time. Any law, every law, they change the characters of people. Hitlerite Germany, you know, one of the most cultured nations in Europe, the Germans, supposed to be. That nation incinerated six million Jews. All right, some say it's a fifth. All right, if not six million, six hundred thousand. If not six thousand, if not six hundred, I say even that is dramatic enough. Just because they were Jews, if you destroy a people, I say it's dramatic enough, whether they were six hundred or six million. How could this nation do such a thing like that? The land of Goit and Beethoven, you know, cultured nation. How can they do that? No, we can all be programmed. See, under Hitler, they programmed the Germans and said, these are parasites. You know, these people here, you know, the Jews, the Jews, the Jews are like this, the Jews are like that. And you, once you work up a nation on that, on that level, emotionally, and even the good-hearted people, they can see what's going on. But they said, close their eyes. They said, look, they deserve it. They deserve it. And they allowed six million Jews to perish. Laws. In our own country. We are living, in this country, everything is based on color. And because everything is based on color, we become color conscious to such an extent that from my own experience I can tell you that uh, since I'm a talker, I talk religion, I love to talk, and I invite, I have been inviting people, the whites, Jews, Christians, of course the blacks as well, Indians, Africans, coloreds, but I'm talking generally about the whites now. I have had hundreds of whites coming to my home. No, I admit them. They enjoy my dinner, they enjoy my food, my curry and rice, my spices. They enjoy it. And they enjoy my talk. Because everything that I'm speaking is from an angle which the man hasn't seen before. So he enjoys my talk and he enjoys my food. But no white man has ever invited me to his home for a cup of tea. Yet. <laughs> and I asked them. You know, they meet me subsequently in the street. Mr. and Mrs. Daniel. Leopold products, I don't know if they still exist in Mobile. In Mobile, Leopold products. He was at my home. Mr. and Mrs. Beer, Beer Brothers, you know, the furniture people, they were at my home. Mr. and Mrs. Baynard, you know, Jews, they were at my home, I don't know. But I said, nobody ever invites me to his house for a cup of tea. When I meet them in the street, oh, they meet me and say, now how's the missus? Says, she's very good, you know, she's very well. He said, convey my regards to her. Which I do, but nobody says, what about coming home for a cup of tea? <laughs> so I asked them, I know it's a big joke, you see, I asked them, he says, you people, don't you know how to reciprocate? Don't you reciprocate among your own people? Of course you do. Then how is it that you don't reciprocate with me? I said, I tell you why. You see, at the back of your mind, at the back of your subconscious, you are thinking in terms of color, that if this guy comes along to my elite home in Durban North, or somewhere in Westville, you know, with this funny headgear and this beard, you know, looking for number 10 Downing Street of yours. <laughs> and I uh, see people are watering the garden and somebody is doing something else and I come along and see the number. I come and knock at the door and Mrs. Smith, you know, she opens the door, smiling face. Oh, Mr. D, that, come, come in, come in. So I go inside there, five minutes goes, half an hour goes, and the tongues begin to wag. He said, what's this woman, Mrs. Smith, doing? You know, I said, well, that coolie has gone inside so long. <laughs> What's happening? You know, is she running a shibi or what? You know, that's just... <laughs> I'm subconscious, you see, subconscious. And if I was there, and if his brother-in-law comes along, Mr. Smith's brother-in-law comes along, he'll have to apologize for my presence. You know what he's going to do? He said, this is Mr. D. Dad. You know, we went to his house and his family, you know, they treated so wonderfully. We had such a lovely meal. All that you have to go out of your way to explain my presence there. 
If it was another Mr. Brown, he said, this is Mr. Brown. He said, hello, hello. You mean to that? <laughs> but Mr. D, that, you have to explain how does it happen that this bully happens to be here. So you have to explain. So this is at the back of the mind. Back of the mind, subconscious. This fear is there. So now, nobody invites me for tea. I don't know somebody might now. <laughs> I hope you don't, because I want to still keep on saying nobody has. <laughs> so, <coughs> we say now that is laws. Laws change the characters of people. So by the time Jesus comes on the scene, the Jews had a law, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. So the Jews forgot forgiveness. See, I was trying to chase the birds. Suppose I was there then, in the time of Jesus. I was trying to chase the birds with the old-fashioned sling, the one that David used, you know, with a stone. And that stone damaged your eye. So you go to the judge, you say, look, this guy here damaged my eye. Damaged his. I said, look, it was an accident. My brother, I didn't mean it. I was trying to chase the birds from the field. So look, forgive me. He said, no, the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. I said, look, I'll compensate you. I'll give you a heifer. I'll give you a goat. Forgive me. He said, no, the law says an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. See, he's going for the letter of the law, he's forgotten the spirit. So Jesus Christ, another spiritual physician among the Jews, he caters for their needs, for the sickness. The man has forgot, for, forgot forgiveness. So now he said, you must forgive and forgive. So how many times, Lord? He says 70 times 7. That's in the Bible, in the New Testament. 70 times 7. Calculate 490. 490. Are you going to take them literally? You're going to start counting? You say, look, this is 10 times, huh? <laughs> now you have done 99 times, huh? And now you have done 200 times. What it means is indefinite. You say, turn the other cheek. You say, uh, if somebody says, it has been said that the whole time, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil. He who strikes you in the right cheek, give him the other. If a man takes away your coat, give him your cloak also. If a fellow makes you to walk one mile, walk with him too. He said, agree with that adversary quickly while thou art with him on the way. Before he takes you before the magistrate and makes you to part with the last father. Beautiful remedy for a sickness. But I said, you haven't got that sickness. I was telling the British, you know, I was there in London uh, in July. And I was on BBC. Uh, you know, they, somebody started, you know, throwing stones at the Muslim. You know, jihad. You know, jihad war, holy war. So I was telling them on BBC one, I said, you see, this holy war that we are talking about, is a war of defense. You've got to defend yourself, your person, your possession, your faith, everything that is valuable, you have to defend it with your life. And I says, you British, you did it. You did the very same thing when Hitler wanted to invade Britain. I heard Churchill, you know, I was young then, but I was hearing Churchill on the radio. He says, he said, we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them in the air, and we'll fight them in the sea, even with broomsticks. He said that, with broomsticks, you're prepared to fight. And you fought, you defended yourself. And then when the time came, you extended your hostilities. You started bombing Berlin and, uh, and, and Mun Munchen and what and what not. You did everything you did. I said, you were entitled to do. As, a, as Gibbon, the master historian, he says that in the state of nature, everyone, every person has a right to defend his person and his position and to extend his hostilities to a reasonable amount of satisfaction and retaliation. In the state of nature, everyone has the right to do that. If you have the right to do that, I, we also have the right to do that. But now, I said, you know, you people are good Christians. You were supposed to turn the other cheek. You were supposed to give your cloak when the man took away your coat. So when Hitler wanted to invade Britain, what you good Christian ought to have done is to tell Hitler, come, open arms, come. Take over Britain and our empire as well. <laughs> that is what should have done, you know, because you're supposed to turn that the cheek. You're supposed to give away your cloak. If you're supposed to walk two miles instead of one. So I says, no. These are all, we say, in the evolution of religion. This is how God Almighty, he caters for your needs, your sicknesses. From time to time, if the sickness changes, the remedy changes. The sickness changes, the remedy changes. So in that evolution of religion, we Muslims believe that Islam is the fulfillment of the teaching of Moses and Jesus. Actually, in real fact, we say it is one religion on different levels. However, uh, well, if you have any questions, I'll be very, very happy to answer. Because I have been warned. He says, you know, much time has passed already. We were supposed to start at half past five. I have been here from quarter to five. 
<laughs> I thought I was the only speaker, half past five, I'm going to get, get going. But now, uh, however, I'm very, very grateful to uh, Mrs. Toms for this privilege and to the chairman for giving me this opportunity. And if there are any questions that we can build further, bridges. if there is a difference, why the difference? If there is a difference, why the difference? Why are we at war in the Middle East? Why are you people fighting? Who? The Jews and the Muslims. What are you fighting for? So I'm telling, I'm telling my people. I get there's a lot of visitors coming to the mosque. This mosque, you know, incidentally, Mr. Singh spoke about it, Mr. Chetty spoke about it, and incidentally also, I have brought it for you. You know, it's given to you in that booklet. This mosque, the largest mosque south of the equator, this one here. On Fridays, we get 4,000, a congregation of 4,000. The Durban population alone brings three bus loads a week through this mosque. And among the people that visit us, there's an invariably people asking the question. He says, now look, what is the difference between your religion and the other religions? So I said, look, most especially with regards to Judaism, Judaism and Christianity, the Jews and the Christians, we are the closest to the Jew. In our concept of the divinity, we are 100% with the Jew. The Jew says that God Almighty is absolutely unique. He has no partners. He has no sons. God is not seen at any time. No man can see God and live. And we give our hand of acceptance to the Jew that we believe as you believe. The Jew says no eating of the flesh of swine. We say we won't eat it. He says no eating of blood. We say we won't touch it. He says circumcision. We say we all circumcised. What more do you want? <laughs> we, believe, we believe in all the Jewish prophets as our prophets and all the heroes as our heroes. I'm not talking about the modern ones. With them we are at all. <laughs> I'm talking about the prophets and heroes in the Bible. We accept them all. So we are at war. What are we fighting about? I said, we are both fighting for a piece of land. My brothers, the Arabs, they say Palestine belongs to them. And my cousin, the Jews, they say Palestine belongs to them. We are both fighting for a piece of land. It is not a racial war. It is not a religious war. The Arab doesn't say kill the Jew because he's a Jew. Jew doesn't say kill the Arab because he's a Muslim. No, no. He says, now this is my land, says the Arab, you stole it, I want it back. The Jew says, no, I inherited it 4,000 years ago, and that's a battle. It's a political battle. There's nothing to do with the religion. With the Christian, we also claim a unique relationship. Islam is the only non-Christian faith, which makes it an article of faith for his followers to believe in Jesus. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus. We believe that Jesus was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission and he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. We are going together. The only parting of the way is we say he's not God Almighty in human form, he's not God incarnate, and he's not the begotten Son of God. Metaphorically, we are all the children of God and he would be nearer to being the Son of God than any one of us because we'll be more faithful to God than any of us can ever be. From that point of view, Jesus Christ is preeminently the Son of God. But our difference is when you say that he is the begotten Son, begotten, not made, so we take exception to that. That is not So if there are any questions at any time now or in the future, if you'd like to visit the mosque, I think the telephone number is there. You can make an appointment and come. And it'll also be my privilege if you come with your wife and says, take you to the mosque, show you what goes on, and take you all for lunch as well. That's on the mosque. <laughs> No, 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 no. I won't. You see, you had a motive. Oh. <laughs> what a wonderful What a wonderful word. I, I, I give it. Thank you. Just to say that, thank you for a most enchanting talk on, not only on the religion of Islam, but on humanity, mankind, and it was most interesting, and I'm sure every one of us had a lovely. Well...